We want to talk and or continue to talk about temperaments. Temperaments, okay? So Proverbs chapter 30, verse 11. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 11. Are we there? A temperament is a basic template with which you are created. We were created by God with certain tendencies, natural strengths and weaknesses. There's a difference between temperament and character. In this chapter, you must understand this basic difference. The temperament is God's method of creating variety. Some people are born with natural tendencies for leadership or joviality or whatever other traits. Others are born with a natural tendency to flow along and to be easygoing. This is the basic structure of your emotional makeup. So what is the character of a person? The character is the personality which is affected by the influences of this life. The character of a person is therefore the product of his personality plus all the external influences. Do you understand it? Character is what you are molded to become. For instance, when you are born, you have a temperament. Temperaments are like color of your eyes, texture of your hair, your height. You inherit all that from your genetic makeup, from your ancestors, from your grandparents. It is the same with temperaments. If you come with short fingers, because your great-grandfather had short fingers, you may also come with a temperament of phlegmatism, because your great-grandfather had phlegmatism. So temperament is not something you choose. Sometimes some people say, Little Reverend, I don't like this temperament, I want the other one. You don't choose. Just like you don't choose the color of your hair, your height, and things like that. You don't choose which temperament you come with. But God, in his wisdom, has made us in so many varieties. And we are saying that temperament is not the same as character. Character is your personality, all right. But your mother has told you, the way you talk is too harsh. It's not good. The way you talk, say please. Say thank you. Do the, so society, your mother, they've molded you, and that becomes your character. But your temperament is raw as you came. But a spirit-filled temperament is a temperament that has allowed the Holy Ghost to take control, to use the weaknesses and make us better people. Amen? And that is why the Bible says, I think in Philippians 2.13, Philippians 2.13, oh, sorry, I said Proverbs 30, but. For it is God who is all the while effectively at, effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and the desire both to will and to work for his good pleasure and satisfaction and delight. That work is God. God. As soon as you get born again, he sends his spirit into you. He sends his presence into you. And that presence begins to work, to change your will, to change your desire. He says, it's God who is at work in us, both to will. You may will not to be a fornicator, but you may not be able. But the Holy Spirit helps you to will and to do. To will and to do. Some people just live by will, but they're doing, they don't allow the Holy Ghost. It's like, my flesh should always have what it wants. But God is actually at work in us to will and to do. So even when people see you and they say, oh, this woman is so Christian, you should know there is nothing that you did. It is just the presence of the Holy Spirit working in us all the time to make us what God wants us to become. Amen. So we have temperaments, whether we are born again or not. But when you become a believer, we have what we call a spirit-controlled temperament, which means that although you landed on this planet with all these things, 
Now, the mastery of your life is in the hands of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is working on you and I and our temperaments to make us more like Jesus and to prepare us for the rapture. Because God is coming for a glorious church, not a church with wrinkles and any such thing. Go back to Proverbs 30. I like to start from there because sometimes people feel temperament is secular or something you just came up with. But God knew about it before you and I got here. There's a class of people, call them class number one, who cares their fathers and do not bless their mothers. Continue. There's a class of people who are pure in their own eyes and yet are not washed from their own filth. Class number two. Number three, there's a class of people, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their raised eyelids. Group number four, there's a class of people whose teeth are as swords and whose fangs as knives to devour the poor from the earth and the needy from among men. They will eliminate you just now with their tongue. It's enough. So now, the Bible is teaching us that there are four classes of people. Unfortunately, like I said last night, it talks only about the negative aspect of temperament. But there are positive traits of temperament. So the first group, they curse their father and they don't bless their mother because they wonder why they were born unto this imperfect world. They wonder why there's so much sorrow, war, and problems in the world. And they dwell more on that. So they wish they were not born. They are the ones who ask, when Adam and Eve sinned, God cried, you should just have finished the whole creation because life is too some way. <laughs> These are melancholics. They have a negative view on, of life. They are more likely to see gloom and doom more than positive things because that is what they see. They are more likely to be moody. Any small thing, they feel like dying. I'll show you examples of all these four temperaments in the Bible. Any small thing, they feel like dying. So they curse their mother and they don't bless their father. Okay? It is often called the dark temperament because when they are at home, they can bring a very sad ambience to the house. When they are not happy, everything around them should not be happy. Most melancholics, when they are not happy and even you are laughing, they get angry with you. <laughs> they want you to join their pity party. They are people who live within themselves. So when you are married to a melancholic, you may have many sins, but you don't know about it. It is all processed in the factory of their minds. Insults are in their minds. Plans are in their minds. Bad things, and because they have a negative slant, everything you do, you have a bad intention. You know, you have a bad thought, that's why you did this. You, you, you are not thinking right, that's why you did this. Your motive is not good, that's why. It, when you get married to them, you can get tired. Because everything, you are not good, you are bad, you are this, you get tired. <clears throat> but that is how they came onto this planet. And they are melancholic people in the Bible. Now I've told you just about their negatives. I'll come to their positives. The second generation or class, they are pure in their own eyes. And yet they are not washed from their filthiness. They usually don't ruffle feathers. They don't worry anybody. And they pay the price of peace at any cost. They don't like conflict. So if the husband shouts, he says, okay, let me just do what he says. Even if it's not right, let me just do it. They are often very diplomatic. And they are very nice people. That's why they don't see the reason why they should be born again. The Bible says they are pure in their own eyes. When they look at themselves, they say, but I'm good. What, what, what evil do I do? They'll say, me, I mind my own business. I don't like conflict. I don't fight with people. I'm a good person. So why are you telling me that I should be born again? 
But how many of you know all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? So those are the phlegmatics. They are also very laid back. So if you are married to a phlegmatic man and he is not spirit controlled, sometimes you really suffer. You will become poor. Because when he should get up and go out there and fight and achieve, and he doesn't have the edge. <laughs> he is very much in love with the verse that I am content with such things as I have. And does not press on to improve your lot in any way. When he has to correct something at home, maybe the tap is leaking or He's a nice person, so he will always promise you that he will do it. But you'll be there for three weeks, the tap will be running, the bills will be high, and he hasn't done it. <laughs> then some people come for counsel, Lady Reverend, I don't know whether I am the leader in the house or I am the wife. They say the man is the head. He doesn't do anything, oh, Lady Reverend. He's always sitting there. But usually, we marry our opposites. So if you also marry the choleric, the hotness in the house, it will not be easy. <laughs> so God in his wisdom usually puts opposites together. The phlegmatic, the Bible says that often he will not do a very risky job. He's likely to be a civil servant, a priest, a teacher, or a diplomat. He will not go to, you know, things that Involve, oh, I gen, you know. I have some of that trait, so I know. You don't want, you want peace, you know. And it is said that they are very stubborn, in spite of their coolness. Stubborn in the sense that they don't move with what you are saying. So if you get angry, you climb on top, you come down. You're like, As it was at the beginning, it's now and ever shall be world without end. Let me tell you something. Phlegmatics often marry cholerics. And when the choleric is ranting and raving, going, moving, actually, the phlegmatic has built a peaceful life within the chaos. And it's not moved at all by all that is happening. And honestly, we ask ourselves, what is the fuss about? What? What? What is the fuss about? We are saying, What's the matter? Take your time, we'll get there. We'll get there. That thing we are in the journey. Why do you want to reach across so quickly? If even it takes 10 hours, you both dry. That's the flavor. And I think that when it's in a man, it's more painful. Because the man is supposed to be your head. Phlegmatics are fearful, but it's hidden. They fear a lot of things, but you won't know because it's inside. And fear does not even let them venture into a lot of things. Sometimes they even themselves don't know that they are led by fear. Phlegmatics talk nicely. They choose their words. They don't find it easy to just tell you as it is. So they'll find a way, you know. How can I tell this person this without offending the person? All that is phlegmatism. Now... The next group, those with high eyes, they live in cloud nine. <laughs> they are not on the planet with us. That is the sanguine. They are always happy. Every day is a party. Every day. Every day is a party. It is said that they don't save. They blow everything they have. They often like very bright colors and they are loud. They like to make friends. It is said that if you have a party and you don't invite a few sanguines, the party will not work. <laughs> because the, the sanguine is the life of the party. And the sanguine will always be saying, let's have a party. Because life is a party. <laughs> and they often are very, they have very large appetites, both sexually and in food and everything. You know, and they are very friendly. When they don't know you, they'll become friends with you now. Yeah. Oh, Lady Pastor Maggie. Oh, so that's your name. 
So what school did you go to? Oh, no, you feel very good about them. When they finish, they move on. They've forgotten your name, <laughs> who you were, what school you said you went to, and you feel, I've met a very nice person. When you go to a party with them, and sanguines will often go and marry the opposite, which is a melancholic, who likes quiet, reserved. So when they go to a party with the melancholic, they will put you here. Then they will go from table to table. Then when they come, the melancholic spouse is very bored. And you left me, and he has not thought about it that he left you. When you are in a meeting with them, and you bring up an idea, they have 45 reasons why it will work. They have very good vocabulary, and they are very encouraging. They will tell you, let's do it, Pastor. This project, I believe, is from God. And Pastor, I believe it's going to work. Then the pastor says, okay. So when shall we meet to execute this project? 8 a.m. tomorrow, Pastor. He will not be there. <laughs> he will not be there. They have problem with timekeeping. They get lost wherever they are going. They don't listen to directions. They get lost. That is the sanguine. And because he's so friendly, he can also have a lot of sexual problems. Because he's too friendly with too many people. The next group, are we done melancholics? The melancholic is not that friendly and is reserved. And many times his or her reservation is read by other people as unfriendliness. But they want friends. Just that they are hoping that you will come and be their friend. Because they, they don't have the capacity to come and make a friend. But when you come, they are very glad you came. <laughs> but people look at them and say, hmm, they are very reserved. When they come to a place, very quiet. And all that. And that's how they, and that is why the sanguine is attractive to them. Because he has what they don't have. This person who just comes to the room and, hey, hi, everybody. Oh, yeah. Let's party. Let's see. So you don't know, but what you lack is what you are attracted to. Yeah. The sanguine also does not have that reserved, whatever. So yet when he sees someone, oh, so calm. She just sits there where I put her, I come and find her there. <laughs> he also gets attracted to you. So opposites often attract. Then the final one is the choleric. He is often a great visionary. And for him, everything is work. Everything is work. It is said that legs are always dreaming about something, moving. They are ahead. They are often ahead of the pack. Ahead, they move. They are visionaries. They build. They are very good businessmen. They are prosperous. So if you are married to them, they will look after you, but they will never be home. The bills will be paid, you'll be given money, you'll buy clothes, you'll go wherever you go, but probably without them, because they'll lead their lives. And actually, when they were trying to wrap you and all that, you are a project. So when that project is finished, they have to move on to the next. And that's what you don't know. They also are very raw in their speaking. And unlike the phlegmatic, they are not diplomatic. Guess what? The phlegmatic is attracted to the choleric. And the choleric is also attracted to the phlegmatic because she's nice, she talks gracefully, she uses the right words, and you are also attracted to the choleric because you haven't seen some before. A whirlwind move, you, the phlegmatic. They say that you are so thick like flame, you don't like to move. So when you see someone, so there, there can be something like this. So you are attracted to that without knowing. So it is said that opposites attract, and after that, they attack. <laughs> so what makes the person attractive to you then becomes a bone of contention when you marry. Because the melancholic will say, we have planned the budget for this month. Why have you spent all the money? Because when the sanguine goes to town, whatever is nice to him, he will buy. Not thinking about how you will live <laughs> after that. But the melancholic is not like that. 
It is said that melancholics are one of the most loyal people you ever find on this planet. When you find them as beloved, it is you and I. We are moving. They are not thinking about anybody else. So the sanguine will bring more people into their lives, and the melancholic may not like that. The melancholic uses sex as favors. We'll come to that. The temperament and their sexual behavior. We'll come to that. So now, Lady River, is it biblical? It is said that the first group was what? Melancholics. It is said that Moses was melancholic. Anytime, sometimes I say, God, kill me. Let me die. These Israelites, I can't. I can't live. And in the end, God had to take his life. Because life and death are in the power of the tongue. Everything kill me. Everything I'm tired. Everything I can't go on. Everything, why am I alive? Everything I want to die. That was Moses. Then the second group who appear in their own eyes, phlegmatic Abraham. That's why he said, Sarah, when we get to this town, you know, there are going to be some difficulties, please. Just say you are my sister. Eh? I don't have energy to be <laughs> expending for things. To the point that Sarah is taken by the king into his bedroom and Abraham does nothing. That is your phlegmatic Abraham. So I've talked about melancholic Moses, phlegmatic Abraham. What's the next temperament? Sanguine Peter. Sanguines have answers before you speak. When Jesus says, Peter, I'm going to die. Hey! Far be it, you won't die. But then Jesus said, Peter, before the cock crows thrice, you would deny. He said, Me, me, deny you. It's like the meeting. He would tell you, You'll be there. He won't come. If I were Peter, because he's the son of God and all the miracles he has done, I won't talk. I would say, that, Is there something Jesus knows that I don't know? But Peter has done already. He said, Lord, I will never deny you. Hey, I will follow you to the end. When Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say I am? Oh, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And when Jesus is washing their feet, Peter said, oh, Lord, not my feet. Bath my whole body. All of us. <laughs> Bath me. Forward, speaking before he thinks. And he surely denied Jesus. Then the choleric is Paul. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? He said, hey, some of you, you think that I'm not powerful, eh? When I come, you will see. <laughs> you see, you are talking over there that what? Paul has done what? I'll be there. And he said, yes, I'm small in such as so my words are weak. Is that what you think? You Corinthians, I will come there. <laughs> then, when he went and met Peter and Co., when the Jews were not there, Peter and Co. will be flowing. When the Jews come, they don't want to greet. And Paul, who was a new convert, said, I withstood Peter and the apostles. I told it to them. You can't behave like that. When the Jews are here, then you are pretending. When the people come, then you are, hey, Peter, you may be the head, but let me tell you, that's not the way. And they are able to endure so many things in fastings often, in reproaches, in necessities. Whatever they have said they have had to do, they will do. He said, I press on towards the mark. He said, endure hardness. They don't like this type of softies around. Be hard. And yet God used all these for, for the building of his kingdom. <laughs> now sometimes when you are one temperament, because you have a certain strength, you despise your partner's weakness. Do you understand? For instance, you may be phlegmatic, and you talk well, you choose your words well, and your partner does not. And because that is not your weakness, you despise him for not being like you. But you also have your weaknesses. And it is often said that your weakness is your strength. If you go and marry a choleric woman, hey, she achieves a lot. But when you ask her a question, the way she answers, the way she answers, and the way she puts her work before you, you are not happy. But it's a temperament. 
because she doesn't see housework as something to be conquered. They want something that you conquer, not something that is just there. So the books say that a phlegmatic can come home, a, a choleric can come home and sleep like a lion. He's sleeping. He's not very interested in what is up. What it is is that he is gathering strength for the next project. Everything is with vision. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a reason. That's the choleric for you. So because the person's strength is, weakness is your strength, you despise the person. And that's why we said yesterday that accept the temperament of your spouse. And accept that it is God who changes us. Amen. Amen. And when you do that, you know that the phlegmatic is not out to get me. In fact, if you do a survey, you will see that that's how he talks to everybody. Everybody. It's only that when you were in love, you didn't hear. <laughs> but that's how he talks to everybody. I remember when I was in a, the law faculty. By the way, there's a difference between law faculty and law school. Law faculty is where you do your first degree. Law school is the macula. So when I was in the law faculty, then Rollins closed the university for a year. And then before the year that we could be called back, my dad said the way the universities were being closed and all that, I should go and continue my law abroad. At that time, my husband was not my beloved, but he was my friend. So I told him, this is my father's plan. He says, what are you going to do? I said, my father has bought my ticket, paid my fees, my deposit and all, so I'm going. So you cannot just get up and go like that. The Bible says you are God's garden. Every garden does not do well in every environment. So you don't just get up. Your father says, go, so you are going. You have to wait on God. And then when you wait on God, you are God's garden. So God will tell you whether this garden does well in the UK or not. But you just get up and then you are going. At that time, he was my friend. So I said, hey, what a revelation. Really, I'm God's garden. Mm. Okay, but anyway, I went. And then he was, my, he was not my beloved. He kept writing to me. Dear Sister Adelaide, has God spoken where you are? <laughs> has God spoken to you where you are? I said, hey, this brother died. Then I would also respond. Then at a point he wrote to me and said that, some people in Ghana will be very heartbroken. Should you consider not coming back? So I decided not to ask who those people are. <laughs> but I decided to wait on God and see what God's plan was for me. Well, I was with my sister. She was doing admin and she was two years ahead of me. So it's like the two of us would do the schooling. So as I prayed and all that, then I saw in London those days, everybody who went back slate because there was no fellowship, there were no churches, you know. And he was saying that you don't look for just education. You look for God's will and for whether you will still stand. You don't just go, you know. So then, those days, the best we knew to wait on God, you fast and pray, and then God leads you. But as we were there, after about two weeks, I saw that the spiritual atmosphere was not good. And even though Victory Church was there, I don't know. I knew that, no, the way things were going, it was not right. Actually, I started to even get sad, not because of him, but because I had friends in Ghana and I wasn't, so I told my dad, I can't be here, I have to go back. My dad said, really, why? I said, oh, I don't think I'll flourish here. So, oh, so I should go for my deposit and everything. I said, yes, so I came back to Ghana. And I came back to Ghana in 1984. Rollins reopened the university and we went back. So when I finished my first degree, then my dad said to go and do the bar abroad. So I was going to travel again because 
in the whole family, I was the first to do pure Ghana like that. So then, at that time, now I had a beloved. This beloved, my father gave me money that I was traveling. So I said, oh, my father has given me some money. So, do you know any nice restaurant where we can have the last supper? <laughs> hey, hey, mommy, let me see. I don't have a lot of money. Oh. I said, well, my father has given me money, so we can spend some before I even go. <laughs> so he said, okay, Ambassador Hotel, Rickshaw. Hey, are you sure your money will be there? So my father has given me to be enough. So we went. And because he hadn't paid and I was going to pay, I thought that he would be humble in the conversation, but there was no such thing. <laughs> so I told him, well, I'm going, but my dad says I can be called to the bar in the UK. So whatever. He stops eating. Say, then let's break up. Oh, why are you saying this? Eh, no, because. If you go abroad, I'm also here. We'll all be under different influences. And then when you come back, I won't know you anymore. I said, ah, what are you saying? So, yes, 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 me, I don't think you should go. And then, those days, I didn't know about temperament. <laughs> hey, by the time we left the dinner table, I was crying. God, been faced. But now when I look, I said, ah, why didn't I see this cholerism? <laughs> so anyway. Then he actually pleaded with me, oh, mommy, you should come back. You see, I think that it's God's will that you come back. You, you can pray about it, but that's what I think. But he was very, uh, what, negotiating. Recently, I heard him preach in first love that he told me, choose or whatever, and then just, <laughs> but it's okay. You have the mic now. <laughs> so it came to pass. And I went, I came back to Makola and all that. After Makola, my father said, oh, you can go on holiday to the States. So I told my husband, I'm going on holiday to the States. Another dinner. This time I think he paid small, uh, spring rolls or something. <laughs> anyway. Then I was going to the airport. And he said, so when are you coming back? So we just finished the exams. I think it was June 30th, it's June. The call to the bar is in October. So I should be back by September. You are coming by, back by September. When we are supposed to be getting married, you say that you've got a student's permit to work there, and then you are coming back. I say, ah, but I'm coming back to be called to the bar. Why should you come in October? Would you have worked enough to say for us to marry us? Hey, what type of... A whole agenda, this. So my father came. My father always took me to the airport. My father said, so you will come back in September. I didn't tell him that I had been faced, but I didn't say anything. So as I was there, September, I thought, oh, let me go and get my ticket, whatever. Those days, landline, uh, my beloved called me where I was. So have you changed your ticket? Ticket change. <laughs> have you changed your ticket? I said, oh, not quite. You see, I want us to get married. Me and my husband, he used to buy things, even in student day. He's bought mugs, sauces, saucepans. He said, we are going to do business at medical school. He went to buy a grill. We will make a kebab at Christian events to save for our marriage. Hey! <laughs> I didn't see the projects. He went to London, he got some award, he came back, he had a big box. I said, what is this? He said, ice cream maker. When we make the kebab, then we also make ice cream. <laughs> then we... <laughs> hey, whenever I came back, he would show me. You see, now I've bought five marks, all covered with graphic. And say, hey. <laughs> this marriage that we are going to <laughs> But I tell you, I didn't process like I'm doing now. It was just, oh, yo, oh, okay. So he made the test. So where will we go? We'll grill it ourselves. Don't you know where they buy meat? We'll buy meat, we'll season it. Whenever we hear the event, we'll go there. <laughs> hey, Rosie. It was all plans and visions. 
And I didn't. So it's like, he's collecting the things for us to marry. So you two, when you go, try and work a bit. You say, your father said, you should be happy. You have a permit, but you will not use it. Because how? We are going to get married. You have to. Do. So have you changed your ticket? No. Let me tell you something. You cannot come to Ghana in September. And when I look back, all that I did, after I hung up the phone, then I would sit by the phone and cry. Uh, that's my response. <laughs> but I'll comply. So in the end, I came back in December. I'm telling you. I came back in December. I've been saved. I bought bed sheets, this, that, that. And I came. When I came, I said, huh? So what did you do? Eight. <laughs> I have to give an account. <laughs> and so, in the church, we were the first to marry. So when he says that, you don't marry with wisdom, uh, with money. You marry with wisdom. You marry with little. He knows what he's saying. Yeah. But you see, it was a whole project. It was a whole project. That is the choleric for you. That is the choleric for you. Do you see? So then, that temperament will lead you far. But that same temperament, you will say that, why is he saying what he's saying in the way he's saying? So it is not our duty to change people. It is our duty to help them change, yes. But not to insist that you should become a phlegmatic like me. You should become a choleric like me. You should become a melancholic like me. It is said that melancholics often choose martyrdom things that involve sacrifice. That's the melancholic. And also, they don't have a lot of friends, but they are faithful to that one friend. You see, I had a friend like that. I met her in the university. Hey, Friday we are going to Christian fellowship. Then she'll say, I bought this uh, blouse. I bought one for you. I said, so that, was, uh, so that we wear it together to the best. Ah, I don't feel like wearing that. <laughs> Very faithful, everything together. It's like the friendship, no. I said, the person has taken it to another level. You see, but she said, that next week, during our retreat, we'll go together. I used to go, but I don't know that we are a twosome doing some retreat. <laughs> Melancholics are very faithful. But when they marry you, their standards are very high because of their own faithfulness. So they expect you to be like that. And usually you will be a sanguine. You are not like that. So then, they are angry inside. When you ask them what is wrong, they say nothing. nothing. Hey. Everything they cry. Everything is sad. Everything is gloomy. When they have a marriage problem, they see that the world has come to an end. That nothing will work. If you tell them, God will give you beauty for ashes. They say, Lady I'm holding the ashes. <laughs> they see the ashes more than even the beauty. That is the melancholic. But faithfulness and loyalty is one thing they have, which the sanguine does not have. The sanguine depends on happiness, what it is moving with, but the melancholic will be faithful to you and expects the same faithfulness. Now you have married a sanguine. How can he do one man, one friend? Hey! Mikuma Danfo. Some of you, you are like that. Your husband is your only friend in this world. And sometimes the husbands get tired and say, look for other friends. Because you don't have any other life. And when that happens, you're always waiting for him. He should come from work. He should take you here. He should, hey, it is too much. It can be suffocating. Amen. So this is the introduction to temperaments. And, uh, these are the four men. Now it is said that most of us have two temperaments, the primary and the secondary. So one will be more dominant than the other. Now, Lady Reverend, what does it mean to have a sanguine husband or wife? I've said a lot of it, but they are emotionally warm. So you will often enjoy an emotionally surcharged relationship. And it is said that they, both, they possess the rich emotions of the four basic temperaments. They are friendly, enthusiastic, feeling-oriented persons who can easily be moved to tears 
by the sad mood of their friends or to joy and excitement by the happiness of others, but all those emotions don't last. They are happy, they are outgoing, they are talkative, like I said. They are stimulating. The weaknesses, they lack discipline, they are prone to exaggerate. Any story they will tell you is at another level. They are disorganized, they are hot-tempered, and they are prone to unfaithfulness. They may be weak-willed. In finances, they are undisciplined with money and they spend anyhow. They are unconstrained and usually overspend. They can be poor, even with good opportunities. Uh, they are angered easily, but also forgive very quickly. They are disorganized spiritually and can be very carnal and fleshly. They lose interest easily and can be unfaithful and weak-willed, especially if their wives are uninteresting. They are untidy, they throw their things about, and they are often not clean. They can enter and leave a relationship easily. The sanguine would throw his things everywhere, and the melancholic person would collect all the things and arrange it line by line and color by color. Melancholic will iron all his things on, on Thursday for the next week. I often wonder why. But the sanguine will take it as and when he goes along. Amen. Sanguines, the women are also talkative. They are messy housekeepers. When they start to tidy the wardrobe, they will not finish because they are easily overwhelmed by work. I've said a lot about cholerics. They are great providers, they are achievers, they are successful. They are very poor in emotions and can be often very insensitive. They tell you the truth even when it hurts and they don't care your reaction. They are not discouraged by problems, but rather energized by problems. And problems drive them to find solutions. They have a dogged determination, which usually allows them to succeed where others have failed, because others become discouraged and quit, whereas the choleric doggedly keeps pushing ahead. They are often born leaders, known as SNLs, strong natural leaders. They seek useful and productive values in life. If he's a Christian, He's usually a very dedicated one. They are very open and honest, sometimes to a fault. They don't sympathize easily with others and do not naturally show or express affection. So you will say, I want somebody who will hold me, who will this, the choleric has not thought about it. And you feel he's mean, but he really doesn't have it within him and has to learn it. His most serious weakness is anger. They can be extremely hostile people. They use their wrath as a weapon to get what they want because they come to realize that other people are usually afraid of their strong outbursts. They willfully cause pain to others and may enjoy it. Their wife is usually afraid of them tend to terrify our children. If you have a spirit-controlled temperament, some of these weaknesses will not be there. They are door slammers, table pounders, and horn blowers. Any person who gets in their way or retards their progress or fails to perform up to the level of their expectation bears the brunt of their wrath. Choleric tend to carry grudges for a long time and they fall prey to ulcers by the time they are 40, often. They are sarcastic and can make scathing remarks which can wither the insecure or devastate the less combative. They usually leave a path of damaged psyches and fractured egos because the other temperament types wilt under their treatment. <clears throat> but if you have a choleric wife, they are take charge women. They will tell everyone else what to do. And they are commanding in their style. 
they shake things up and they make things happen. They are very energetic and outgoing and always up to something new. They can be bossy and overly domineering. They are often considered a threat by other men <laughs> and resented and judged by other women who tend to want to cut her down to size. The choleric woman believes she can do whatever she sets her mind to do. She's got nerve that she can be used in powerful ways for good. No matter what the obstacles, she will hold firmly to her belief and she can do it. They are determined. They often struggle after leaving the workplace to stay home with their children because they think there's nothing specific to accomplish with housework. Nothing is ever finished. This is because they thrive on the battle to battle challenge and challenge to challenge, conquest to conquest routine of the workplace. They notice wrongs and injustices of life and feel compelled to set things right. They are the ones who crusade for change. They are productive, open, honest, effective disciplinarians. If your mother is a colleague, she's a dis effective and a forceful woman with many goals in mind. Weaknesses, they are often unpopular. They are mean, they get angry quickly. They are self-interest, they are self-centered because they are just interested in themselves and their projects. They are impulsive, they are workaholics, and they are not often very domesticated as wives. They are frank and have sharp tongues. They have a hot temper, and they may be very unforgiving towards their husband. They may be so active at home, pursuing countless activities that her spouse may feel unwanted. She may even find activities to do in the night. They don't take time for real conversation and they are easily threatened by questions. The choleric woman is usually not very popular because other males feel threatened by her and she's often resented and judged by other women. Hello? Melancholic husband, sensitive. They like the fine arts, good music, faithful but don't make friends easily. Seldom push themselves to meet other people. Dependable of all the temperaments because of their perfectionist tendencies. They are hard to please because they are perfectionists. They have a strong desire to be loved by others. They are analytical and diagnose accurately the obstacles and dangers of any project. They have a part in planning. This makes them not so enthusiastic to start a new project. They may occasionally produce some great work of art, but such accomplishments are followed by great bouts of depression. They find their greatest meaning in life through personal sacrifice and usually choose a difficult vocation. No temperament has so much natural potential when energized by the Holy Spirit. He can fulfill his potential thinking of the positive aspects of life and by being a thankful praiser. He may be rich because of self-sufficiency and hard work. They are good listeners. They are very tidy and will impose it on you. They are so consumed with looking for the perfect partner that they may be slow in choosing one. Hmm, so that's the melancholic. They find it difficult to forgive. They are very choosy about dressing, colors, and what to eat. They are constantly arranging things. All right? And phlegmatics, I've told you. They can make a crowd of people shake with laughter and yet never smile sometimes. They are capable of seeing something humorous in others and their actions, and so maintain a positive approach to life. They have a retentive memory and are capable of being a fine imitator, usually mixed one of the other temperament kinds. The te phlegmatic tends to be a spectator in life and tries not to get very involved with the activities of others. 
they are not easy to motivate past their usual daily routine. The phlegmatic will not volunteer for leadership on his own, but when it is forced on him, he proves to be a very capable leader. He acts as a natural peacemaker. Okay, so these are the traits of the various temperaments. The temperaments in sex, page 185. The sanguine husband and sex. He's so responsive, it does not take much time to turn him on. <laughs> He's so open about everything he does that his wife is always aware of his mood. He has a great appetite for everything, including lovemaking. He must have very few hang-ups about sex. He usually enjoys it. Sex, like food, is one of the important things in life to them. That's sanguines. They are usually reluctant to take no for an answer when they want food or sex. They can easily be hurt and feel deflated if his wife does not respond to his gestures of love. They may be more easily unfaithful if not sexually satisfied because the conquest of another woman is important to satisfy his ego and he finds lonely, unfulfilled women easy prey to his charm. He's weak-willed and emotionally excitable and is therefore open to the unscrupulous woman. The sanguine wife and sex, it's important to her. She's unrestrained about sex, she flows. She will do almost anything sexually if she's taught. She overcomes most sexual inhibitions and hang-ups and can become aggressive. She's not cadaveric in sex. She doesn't behave like a dead body. A lot of men feel comfortable in her presence. Her charming personality makes her a hit for all types of men. And in her naivety, she can turn them on without knowing. She usually thinks she's just being friendly. She does not take too much coaxing to get into the mood to make love. Usually maintains a good attitude about sex in spite of what she might have heard before marriage. She can be sexually aggressive and do the inviting. She has a tremendous desire to please her husband and with a reasonable amount of encouragement will usually succeed in this area of marriage provided her partner does not hammer away at her faults in other areas. The choleric husband and sex. He does not indulge in much foreplay. He goes straight to the point. He just wants it quickly, and then he's on his way. He soon learns, however, that he has to be tender and loving. He appears to be a great lover on the surface. Unable to lavish affection on his spouse and impatient, this makes adjustment difficult for the wife. He's likely to take his wife into the bedroom without the slightest sex education himself. This is because he's usually impulsive and thinks that things will work out anyway. He learns quickly, is practical, and will therefore make necessary changes to lovemaking. If he finds that affection is exciting and that watching the woman he loves respond to his love is extremely fulfilling, he will go for it. The choleric wife in sex. She can either make her husband very happy or unhappy sexually. If she has had a good upbringing, teaching, and parents' influence, she's exciting and creative. If she has had bad teaching, molestation by a parent, an adult, or other traumatic experiences, she's very difficult sexually because she's an opinionated individual. If she observes a warm, loving relationship between her parents while growing up, she will enter marriage expecting to enjoy lovemaking. And because cholerics usually achieve what they set out to do, she and her husband will not be disappointed in their sexual life. If she has been raised in an unhappy home or environment, has been molested, and we've said that, she may encounter serious difficulty in relating properly to her husband. This is because the choleric forms such strong opinions about things that once she has that idea, it is difficult or impossible for them to change their minds. 
Since collaborative wives are not usually given to open affection, they may stifle their husband's advances before their own motto rolls into action. If not spirit-filled, the choleric wife may emasculate her husband, that is, make him nothing, by dominating and leading him in everything, including sex. If she isn't interested in sex herself, she and her usually phlegmatic husband may go for long periods without sex. A choleric wife must not interpret a phlegmatic husband's passivity about sex to mean he, had, he enjoys abstinence. He is actually expecting her to take the lead. In the end, an explosion will occur that would have a very serious and undesirable effect on the marriage. The melancholic husband and sex, he is a supreme idealist. He usually goes into marriage without sex education because he believes the ideal will happen. If his wife is loving, amorous, and exciting, and very expressive, things may work out fine. If he marries someone as naive as he is, he and his wife may return from the honeymoon depressed. <laughs> a shaky sex life can make a melancholic husband very unhappy and depressed. Their depression will turn off their wives. Melancholics usually find it difficult to seek counseling and wait until their marriage is almost breaking to get help because they find it difficult to approach anybody. Hmm. Where are we? Number seven, okay. The melancholic husband is able to express true love more than any other temperament. He's usually a loyal and faithful partner unless he indulges in impure thoughts that lead to promiscuity. When the melancholic loves his wife, he will almost overextend himself in thoughtfulness, kindness, and emotion. He's usually very romantic. He does the things that delight the romantic heart of a woman, like playing soft music, dimming lights, using perfume. <laughs> his analytical nature makes him learn quickly what pleases his wife, and then he enjoys bringing her fulfillment. If everything goes well for them, they make great lovers. But since life does not turn out perfectly, and the melancholic is such a perfectionist, he may also refuse to accept anything less than perfection. Little things like dirty dishes in the sink or a messy floor can turn a melancholic off sexually. Hmm. He's likely to interpret as rejection his wife's lack of immediate response to sex when he initiates lovemaking. If his wife tries to play a little hard to get sex, he's likely to think she does not desire him and may give up before she can reveal her true feelings. Mm. A melancholic wife and sex. It's an unpredictable love partner because she has the greatest of all mood swings. Today she's happy, tomorrow she's not. <laughs> On some occasions, she can be as exciting and stimulating as any sanguine. On other occasions, she has absolutely no interest in anything, including love. At times, she may meet her husband at the door and sweep him off his feet right into the bedroom, but at other times, she may ignore his arrival completely. Mood swings. She is the supreme romantic, and her moods are as apparent as the noonday sun. When in the mood for love, she resorts to dinner by candlelight, soft music, and heavy perfume. She's capable of enjoying ecstatic love at heights that would choke other temperaments, but she does not do that frequently. To her, quality in sex life is preferable to quantity. Amen? <laughs> of all the temperaments, she's the one who gives love as a reward for good behavior. And no man enjoys that. She can be excessively religious about sex, especially if her mother had a problem in this area. She may use religious arguments and Bible verses to excuse her sexual abstinence. She always say, I'm praying. Abstain to pray. Come together quickly. She will not read that part. Probably the real reason for her sexual abstinence may be that she has a fixed idea before marriage that sex is not a good thing. 
she may hardly give herself the opportunity to learn that sex is good and desirable. Is usually interested in sex when she wants to get pregnant and have children. Seemingly little things can be turned into huge problems for the melancholic wife. For example, her husband's inability to balance the checkbook, failure to run an errand, neglect to bath can be a major problem. This may thoroughly upset her and send her into quiet revenge. She has to realize that she is cheating herself out of both the enjoyment of lovemaking and the loving approval of her husband. She has the potential of being an exciting and fulfilling love partner if her weaknesses do not overpower her strengths. Amen. The phlegmatic husband does not say much about the bedroom life, is closed-mouthed concerning his personal life. Most comments about his intimate life will come from his angry spouse, who is usually also very biased. Usually will have little trouble gaining the love of his wife because he rarely embarrasses or insults her. Sarcasm is just not his way, and he will usually not embarrass her publicly or say anything derogatory. Since he rarely gets angry or creates irritation, he usually extinguishes his partner's fire by a soft answer before bedtime. <laughs> his wife may soon feel unloved because he does not assume initiative in the bedroom. The wife has to be heard even in the bedroom. So she loses respect for him because he does not assert his manhood. He may produce resentment in his wife because he's stingy, politely stubborn, and self-indulgent, which is equal to being selfish. Usually finds it difficult to talk about anything. I mean, cannot talk about real issues, what he's going through, he's not able. Okay, and therefore does not tell his wife what he finds exciting about lovemaking. He will silently endure less enjoyable relations with his wife for years, and therefore rob both and his wife of many ecstatic sexual experiences. Last in this chapter, the phlegmatic wife and sex will usually give in to her more forceful mates than to create turmoil. Is easily satisfied and will often turn her attention to her children if trouble arises between her husband and herself. She rarely initiates lovemaking, but will always never turn away her husband because she wants to please him. Her lovemaking is greatly affected by fear and anxiety. She may fear pregnancy disclosure, embarrassment, and a host of other real and imagined dilemmas. She can easily be afraid that her husband may lose respect for her if she appears too eager or forward in lovemaking. She must learn to create and maintain interest in her personal appearance, like her hair, attire, and weight. She's lazy about everything, including her appearance, okay? Number six, her disorganization may cause such resentment in her husband that it may spill into their bedroom life. Number seven, her husband must endeavor to be a strong, gentle, and thoughtful lover who learns how a woman functions best and takes time to arouse her to orgasm. Once she learns the art of lovemaking, her desire for the experience will overpower her and tendency to be passive, thus making her an exciting partner. Nine, her husband must be someone who verbally assures her of her worth and his love so that she can draw courage to overcome her fears. She must learn to overcome her inability to speak about the way she feels and communicate with her spouse about their sex life. Amen. Well, This is a chapter that a pastor ignored for his church member. And I didn't know, but the church member came from another church. Two weeks of marriage, turmoil. So as I listened to her stories, I realized that if she knew about temperaments, she would handle it better. So I asked her, what 
curriculum was used for your marriage counseling. And she said, Lady Reverend, though I'm not in this church, Bishop Dag's book was used. And I said, if Bishop Dag's book was used, did you not learn about temperaments? No, never heard of it. I said, why? I said, when we got there, our pastor said it's not necessary, so we skipped it. How is it not necessary? It even explains all our sameness and our strengths and our weaknesses and allows us to work on them. When you read on your own, you will see how you can be a spiritual sanguine, a spiritual melancholy. That's the next chapter after what we read. You know, all this is so helpful. It brings light. You know, you walk in darkness till the light comes on. And knowledge is power. The Bible says, my people perish for lack of... Look at even these types of marriages. A lot of you don't know that there's any such thing. And a lot of you feel that the important part about the marriage is the color scheme, the cake, and the what? The bridal train. But just knowledge opens us up to light and sets us free. So it is important. Knowledge may be in a book. And unless you read it, you will never know it. So please, it is time to follow a definite curriculum. It is time to tell your people when they are coming to bring notebooks. Because when you bring a notebook and you write, you remember. It's not even that you will refer to it all, but you remember. And then later on, you become, even if it's your model marriage book, you can write in it. I write a lot every time I'm preaching my model marriage books. And everywhere I have gone in the past, when I finish, they take the book away. So I don't have the book. So this time, I'm not going to give the, the book away. It's the same book, but maybe I've added a few things, expatiated on this. Uh, then the people say, Lady Rebecca, we have your book. And I've always given it to them, including my clothes. But now I've stopped. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So before I came today, I just sensed that we should have a question and answer time. And then Bishop Fabian just came up and said, he thinks we should continue with the Q&A. So I will invite him up, and then he will show us when and what. Oh. Wow. Please put your hands together for <laughs> Lady Reverend Adelaide Heward Mills. I tell you, she has poured herself out to us. Please show some love.